Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's uh, uh, R&D parallel session. Uh, we still have a minute uh, before the start. I just wanted to take this minute to uh, basically get ahead of the slide presentations. Um, we have uh, 15 minutes allocated per speaker with five minutes for discussion. Uh, when you want to ha ask a question, please use the raise the, raise the hand option um, at the end of uh, the talks. Um, I will annotate on the slides of the speakers the remaining time. Mm -hmm. I will try to do that at five and two minutes uh, before the end of the talk. And uh, with that, uh, I would like to invite our first speaker, Katarina Dort of the Justus Liebig uh, Universität Gießen, uh, to present her talk on silicon pixel detectors R&D for future laptop colliders. When you're ready, over to you. Okay, thanks a lot for the introduction and also thank you for the opportunity to present our um, research topic here. So, um, yes, I will talk about the silicon pixel detector R&D for future lepton colliders. Let me switch to the next slide. So um, there are actually several proposals for future lepton colliders, both in a linear and a circular layout and with a wide range of maximum um, center of mass energies. But I guess the main um, topic here is that they all combine um, similar, uh, similar physics programs. So they all um, want to measure or want to have precision measurements for Higgs and top quark physics, but also for electric precision observables and beyond the standard model searches. And for all of this, you basically need an excellent vertex and tracking detector uh, or excellent vertex and tracking detectors in order to have, a, um, in order to resolve the secondary vertices and have an excellent momentum resolution. And here are a few pictures of one of these proposed uh, future electron or uh, lepton colliders. Um, as I said, the uh, uh, vertex and tracking detectors for these um, collide or for these experiments are essential. And of course, also the demands on them are quite stringent. So you need, first of all, of course, a very low material budget for precision measurements. And with this also comes a low power consumption in order to reduce material for cooling. And then you would also need a high spatial resolution, also good time resolution down to five nanoseconds or so in order to um, um, uh, suppress background. Um, and there's also the option to have precision timing. So approximately below 100 picoseconds for particle identification. And I would say the only good news here is that um, the requirements and radiation hardness is, are less stringent compared to LHT experiments. But of course, this um, um, we already have quite demanding um, requirements here. So maybe this is not a, a big factor. Um, there is, of course, a big difference whether you look at a linear or a circular collider in terms of uh, requirements for tracking detectors. I would say the main differences um, are related to the duty cycle for a linear collider but then also for background levels, um, which tend to be higher for a linear collider, um, given, the, the, um, co given the experiments we have looked at. And that's why I will focus in this talk on the um, click tracker, since this belongs to the click uh, experiment, which is a linear collider. Um, you can see here an overview of the silicon detector R&D for the click uh, tracker or for the click vertex and tracker. Um, so we've studied both uh, monolithic sensors and also hybrid assemblies, and you see um, an overview of the chips we have studied here. And I will show you a few examples in the next uh, couple of slides. And all of these studies, of course, need dedicated and well-tested, um, well-developed tools. And these we have uh, um, well-developed and also provided for the entire community. So for example, a readout system, simulation framework, and also an analysis framework for test beam data. So let me um, start with the first example chip, which is a hybrid fine pitch pixel detector, the so-called ClickPix2 readout ASIC. It has a pixel pitch of only 25 by 25 micrometers, so quite small. And as you can imagine, uh, the bump bonding or the interconnection process is quite challenging with such a small pixel pitch. You see one example here where the sensor is bump bonded to an ASIC um, and okay, the connection look uh, very good. And we have also found that um, we get a high, very high interconnection yield of up to 99.6%. And this also means, of course, that the efficiency of our sensor is um, very good. So you see this, for example, here, the efficiency against uh, the threshold um, is above 99.9% .9 over a quite a wide threshold range. Um, also, the other performance parameters look quite promising. So for example, the position resolution 
about three micrometer, but for let's say rather thick sensors of about 130 micrometer. Okay. And uh, the time resolution is also below five nanoseconds, which is what our target was. And um, the only, let's say, challenge so far is uh, if we go to our target thickness of about 50 micrometer, uh, we are still investigating to go to a um, high spatial resolution. So this is still something we are currently studying. There's also a different op or an alternative to a bump bonding interconnection, which is using so-called anisotropic conductive films. But these are um, adhesive epoxy films um, where some um, conductive microparticles are embedded. And if these microparticles are um, crushed between pets, you get an electrical connection. And this helps for, or this has the prospect of um, helping for hybridization studies, as I said before, but also for module integration. And for module integration, there's one example here. So we have used a 50 micrometer LPAT sensor um, connected to a flexible printed circuit board and uh, sorry, flexible printed circuit. And you see this, um, this example of a connected device down here. And we have achieved electrical or excellent electrical contact and also nominal power consumption. So I would say this looks quite encouraging. Um, on the hybridization side, it's a bit more challenging. Um, but also for this, we have some in-house techniques such as um, chemical ENIC process, which uh, gives you these underbump metallization. And this is nicely visualized here, um, where we have our um, readout ASIC at the bottom, the sensor at the top, and then you have these UBM or underbump metallization structures here. And you see, you can see these um, small microparticles which are crushed between the UBMs. And with this, you get then the electrical interconnection between uh, sensor and readout ASIC. Um, and in order to uh, well to connect the two chips, we also have an in-house semi-automatic flip chip bonder, and um, I can show a few um, results here where we did bonding tests of the TimePix3 and the ClickPix2 ASIC um, using this kind of these kind of parameters, and we have basically established the proof of concept for the bonding um, for areas up to um, one centimeter squared and fifty-five micrometer pitch. Um, if you go now to larger areas or smaller pixel pitches, this becomes quite more challenging because a larger bonding force is required. And of course, with a given clip chip machine, that's not always um, easy to achieve. Um, but one nice example you can actually see down here, where we use the TimePix3 sensor, uh, ASIC, uh, and here is such an ACF uh, strip. So we only now um, um, had ACF on a, on a strip-like structure, and um, you can see then how the result looks if we illuminate the time pick three with a strontium source, you can see we get very high hit rates, which of course gives you or indicates a good interconnection here in the middle where the, the strip was located. And then you also see that some ACF is actually uh, leaking out of this strip towards um, the, the rest of the matrix. You can see you can bond quite a, quite a big area in, in this way. Um, now coming to the monolithic centers. So there we focused on a 180 nanometer CMOS imaging process with a small collection electrode. And with the small collection electrode, you get a very low um, capacitance, which is beneficial for um, signal to noise ratio. And we study different uh, sensor designs. So this was basically the standard design. And then we also went to a design where we had a deep low dose N implant, which gives you full lateral depletion in the device. So you see here, you only have the depletion around the collection electrode and with the low dose and implant um, it covers the, the device laterally. And then also we had two more um, um, flavors where we introduced a gap or segmentation in this N implant, which introduces here a lateral junction um, or, or um, sorry, a vertical junction, which is a lateral doping gradient, which then um, increases actually lateral electric, electric fields and this gives you a, um, an accelerated charge collection, which is beneficial in, in many, um, for many performance parameters. And in a similar manner, we also introduced these extra DP wells, which is also a, a vertical junction, has basically the, the same effect. And before I show you this uh, experimentally, I would like to say a few words for the um, simulation studies we performed, because they are quite um, essential in order to, um, well, to optimize these kind of designs. Um, well, basically, as you already see, these, these sensors are quite complex, and it's also shown here where you see an electric potential. So with these complex sensor designs, we need um, sophisticated uh, simulation tools. And these we have basically um, studied, or we've come up with a simulation approach 
where we combined finite element simulation with a Monte Carlo tool. And in this way, we combine an accurate sensor modeling with high simulation rates. So basically the best of both worlds. And um, we have also shown that this um, works very, very well by validating it um, against trend in 3D TCAT simulation and also against data. And you see one example down here. So we have, where we looked at the cluster size um, against threshold for data and simulation. And you basically see it's matching um, quite well. Now, as promised, the experimental verification of these different um, designs is shown here. So for this, we use the Click TD um, technology demonstrator. You see the main chip parameters here. I don't think I, uh, we need to go through them, but basically the, the main performance of the device is maybe a bit more interesting shown here. Um, we achieve actually very low thresholds um, and also low um, noise with a good spatial resolution, be low five micrometer, and also a decent time resolution of about five nanoseconds, actually just limited by the front end. Um, very high heat detection efficiency, and also we can thin the sensor um, quite well. And now on the heat detection efficiency, you can actually see the effect of the different um, sensor designs. So here you see the efficiency against threshold, um, and you can see that for the continuous N implant, so the one without any lateral um, doping gradients, so without the um, accelerated charge collection, you can get, of course, a good um, efficiency, but then it drops at, at quite high thresholds. But with the segmented N implant, um, this efficiency plateau actually extends further because you have less, um, you have an accelerated charge collection, and in this way, less charge sharing, and with less charge sharing, of course, more charge per pixel um, or higher concentration of charge per pixel, and this then improves the efficiency at these very high threshold. So a nice experimental verification, I would say, um, for these different sensor designs. Okay, um, also for the ClickTD technology demonstrator, um, we have looked at some advanced materials. So recently we've got a production using high resistivity Stuhalski wafers. So before we had um, what you've seen here before was um, just um, a low resistivity substrate and on top of that an epitaxial layer. Now we have a material here where we have high resistivity in the entire sensor, which um, allows for a larger decreased volume and with this also, of course, larger um, active sensor volume. And this basically improves every performance parameter. Um, so for example, for the efficiency, you can see here that you get um, large efficiency plateau with the high resistivity um, substrate, uh, Stuchalski substrate shown here in red compared to the one with, with the IPI layer just because you get more signal um, out of the sensor. And the same, as I said, holds true for every other performance parameter. And this table basically shows an, an overview of this. So here in the first um, column, you see the requirements for the click tracker. Okay, and then for the IPI layer, we already see, um, okay, we fulfill basically all of the requirements already. But then if we go to the wafer with um, Stuchalski, high resistivity Stuchalski material, the performance improves even more, which is very nice. Although I have to say we are still limited here by, by our front end. So I think these materials have a very high potential which um, is not fully exhausted in, in this device, but of course shows the, the prospects of it. Um, now coming to the, the last topic for the monolithic sensors. So here we studied a technology demonstrator for sub nanosecond timing resolution. Um, this is a so-called fast pick sensor. It's also 100, uh, modified 180 nanometers imaging process. But um, in contrast to, to click TD, we now have not a full matrix, but several uh, mini matrices with different parameters, different pixel pitches and so on. Um, and what is quite striking is that we went away from the traditional um, rectangular pixels to hexagonal pixels. And the main motivation here were um, 3D T-cut studies where we found that the hexagonal pixels give you an accelerated um, charge collection with just a better time resolution. So you see this, this here. Um, and with this hexagonal pixel layout, um, yeah, we, we um, hope to improve the, the time resolution of the device. And the, the reason for um, why the hexagonal pixel layout is better is, I think, intuitively quite clear. So first of all, you improve actually charge collection at the pixel edges um, here. And then also you re reduce the number of uh, neighboring pixels, which results in less charge sharing. And um, this, of course, then enhances the the um, time resolution. Of course, with the good sensor timing, you also need a fast readout in order to resolve the sensor time. 
So there's also quite a complex uh, readout design we have there. And um, I would like to show a few highlights of the measurements which we performed so far. First of all, the um, calibration shows that we can also go to very low thresholds and noise levels. And then on the timing resolution side, we have found that there's quite strong, strong time walk effects in the device. And without time walk correction, we can go down to a, a time resolution of about 500 picoseconds, which is still, of course, quite good and below one nanosecond, actually. Um, but if we then perform time walk correction, we can actually further go down here um, to 120, 180 picoseconds or so, uh, depending on the, um, on the specific matrix we're looking at. So this is quite quite a current guys, I think, especially for a monolith extension. This already um, brings me to the summary and outlook. So you have seen we have quite a diverse R&D program with, uh, in order to meet the challenging requirements of future vertex and tracking detectors for lepton colliders. On the hybrid um, assembly side, we've looked at fine pitch bump bonding and also some alternative interconnection techniques. And you have seen that with the ClickPix2 ASIC, we basically fulfill all of the requirements for the um, click vertex um, detector um, individually. But then if we combine all, all of these um, requirements with a low material budget, that's still somehow um, somewhat challenging. And we are um, working on this. Um, on the monolithic sensor side, we mainly focused on small collection electrode sensors, where we studied optimized sensor designs, wafer materials, and pixel geometries. And we found that we meet the tracker requirements um, with, for example, the ClickBD demonstrator, which is very nice. And then also with uh, on the side of sub nanosecond time resolution, this we have also achieved um, going down to about 100 picoseconds or so with the FastPix demonstrator. And there's also some, um, or a lot actually, of future um, development going on. So, so far we have studied a 180 nanometer CMOS imaging process, and right now we are also going to a 65 nanometer CMOS imaging process. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention, and um, I'm happy to answer our questions. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions to Katarina? Robert? Hi, yes. Um, I just wanted to ask about the, um, so you, you, you mentioned um, the, uh, the effect of reducing charge sharing by using the segmented N implant, um, which I thought was really, really nice. Um, what I wanted to ask was whether there have been any studies done of um, the, uh, how this affects the efficiency um, if you change the, the lateral position, um, particularly with regards to whether you're incident between the two segments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks a lot for the, the, the question. Um, yes, so actually, um, um, so the, the main chart sharing of course occurs um, between the two, uh, between two pixels. So in, in this um, representation, we have one pixel here, that basically we have um, the corner or the, the, the border of the pixel here and then the second pixel here. And of course, most of the charging happens in between these two. Um, and that's why we have the segmentation at this, um, this border. I think that's quite, quite intuitive that in this way, we can basically bend, or let's say, so to say, bend the field lines towards the collection electrodes. I think this is also seen, okay, not, not so well, but basically um, here you can see here's the edge and um, the field lines are then bent, let's say, towards the collection electrode. So I would say the, the position of the, of the segmentation, um, let's say, has to be here in order to reduce charge sharing. But what we can study is different um, sizes of this, this gap. And actually, um, this is not, so we haven't done this experimentally, um, but this we have done simulations and we have optimized this, um, this gap in order to reduce the charge sharing as, as far as possible. Okay, really nice. Thank you. Okay, we have a question by Yuji. Hello. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not totally expert on this, but uh, yeah, my question is uh, on the new technique on the bonding, uh, page six or seven. So this the new technique. I'm wondering, is this the stable against the radiation in terms of the connecti uh, conductivity? Mm -hmm. Um, so, so far we haven't uh, study, studied um, radiation hardness experimentally. Um, I also think for, let's say for lepton colliders, this might not be as, as important. Um, 
I would think, um, mm. so I'm, I'm, I'm not 100% sure, but I would say it, it should be radiation hard because it's also studied for module integration, for example, for, um, for the ATLAS experiment. And uh, there, of course, radiation hardness is a lot more important. Um, yeah, but um, so I, I would expect this to be radiation hard. I also um, can't think why, why it shouldn't be, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm also not 100% sure there. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else? I don't see further raised hands. I had a question myself. I found this uh, fast fix uh, really impressive uh, with the sub nanosecond uh, resolution. Uh, and this hexagonal shape is quite interesting. Um, what are the main challenges of producing those shapes or using those? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so I would say on the on the sensor um, side that's uh, or let's say on the on the side of the um, optimization of the sensor this is not uh, too much of a difference however for the um, for actually integrating um, the electronics um, that's quite more challenging just because I would say all of the designers of these chips are used to rectangular designs and then going to hexagonal design somehow um, changes their uh, their, let's say, normal libraries, which they're using. So there's a quite a, a, um, a change in how they usually design um, chips. However, um, as far as I've heard, is one, once they have basically ad adapted, this is not a, a big problem. And actually, it's um, um, quite beneficial because you see that um, with hexagonal design, it's more like a, a circle. So you can actually fit more electronics in there. Um, yeah, but then of course also on the um, reconstruction side and so on, uh, this is um, a bit more difficult because most of all of our algorithms are adapted to square or rectangular pixels, and then having hexagonal pixels is a difference, of course, in the um, in the matrix and also in the well, then in the whole reconstruction chain basically. But I would say for all of this, you need basically to adapt once um, to this hexagonal shape, and then it's it's uh, fine. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you can stop sharing. And with that, I would like to invite our next speaker, speaker Priyanka Kashru from uh, Grand Sasso Science Institute. She yeah. will speak about cryogenic characterization of silicon multipliers for future dark matter experiments. Uh, can you see my slide? Yes, we can see your slides. OK. Uh... Okay. okay, so I will start. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm thankful to, to the organizers for the opportunity to, pre uh, to let me present my work on cryogenic characterization of silicon photomultipliers for the future dark matter experiments. So let me set the course for the presentation with this list, list of uh, contents. Uh, first, we will see what are the goals for the future dark matter detectors with a focus on uh, liquid argon detectors and their future. Then I will discuss the fundamentals of SIPMs, uh, the kinds of SIPMs we have used for our studies. And then I will dive into the technical aspects of uh, quantifying SIPMs, such as noise characterization, timing resolution, and photon detection efficiency. And finally, I will end with the uh, conclusions and outlook. So let's start with the goals. Uh, the goals for the future noble liquid uh, dark matter experiments is firstly to keep low radioactive background from the uh, detector body, uh, photo detectors, and detector target mass, aiming for sensitivity closer to neutrino floor, uh, achieving low energy threshold to observe smaller cross sections, uh, high energy precision, uh, uh, high precision uh, position reconstruction uh, to facilitate uh, uh, localization of uh, background and signal events. Uh, increased um, exposure time for better background to signal discrimination. And my studies have been uh, largely focused on achieving the third and the fourth uh, bullet points of this set goals. Uh, sorry, I cannot move my slides. Okay. Uh, sorry, I cannot move my slides. Okay. Uh, here are some important detector technology requirements that we have to follow to build our next generation uh, liquid argon-based dark matter detector. As far as the detector body and materials are concerned, 
the um, radioactivity should be less than one millibacterial per kilogram. Uh, concerning photodetector requirements, apart from it being highly radio pure, uh, they should have photon detection efficiency at uh, 420 nanometer uh, at nine volts over voltage, uh, uh, greater than uh, 40%. Uh, then the dark count rate, which is intrinsically produced in the photosensors at nine volts over voltage uh, at uh, 77 Kelvin should be less than 0.1 Hertz per millimeter square. And the total uh, contribution to neutron background should be less than 0.1 neutrons per 200 ton year exposure. Um, lastly, the intrinsic noise uh, probability originating again from the photosensors uh, at 9 volts over voltage should be less than 50%. And with these uh, set goals for physics and photo, de photo detection in mind, uh, now I will move to more specific uh, liquid argon uh, dark matter detector called toxi 20 k which will be the first dark matter detector to employ uh, silicon photomultipliers as photo detectors at a mass production scale. And this is a famous uh, exclusion plot here showing the cross section versus the uh, mass of the BIM detector. And with the dashed blue line here, you can see that the sensitivity of uh, dark side 20k reaches to nearly 10 to the minus 48 centimeter square of cross section with its target run uh, period of 10 years with a 20 kilogram fiducial volume. And then the other uh, dotted and dashed lines are the projected sensitivity at the different exposures. Now to realize this uh, sensitivity, uh, SIPMs were chosen as the photodetector technology. So let's try to now understand why SIPMs were the first choice for the photo detection. <clears throat> so SIPMs uh, are uh, novel solid state uh, devices with array of photodiodes, uh, which are uh, called cells that are typically around 100 to 10,000 per millimeter square. The SIPMs have several advantages against uh, PMTs, their contact, uh, compact uh, geometry, um, low operating voltage, uh, excellent timing resolution, excellent photon resolution, uh, high photon detection efficiency, uh, low radioactivity, uh, low costs, and their ability to be easily scaled for mass production. So, however, uh, this all these perks come at a price. Uh, they are temperature dependent, and so we need to uh, minimize these noises in order to reduce the rate of uh, accidental coincidences at uh, low energy thresholds. Uh, so, the current uh, technologies for large area SIPMs are uh, RGB sensitive uh, SIPMs, and it has the photon detection efficiency uh, maximum around uh, 550 nanometer wavelength. And then there are the near UV uh, SIPMs, which are sensitive uh, to shorter wavelengths, having maximum photon detection efficiency around 400 uh, nanometer, as you can see in this picture. So for our purpose, uh, since argon scintillation wavelength after wavelength shifting uh, is around 420 nanometer, we chose uh, the near UV uh, SIPMs. Uh, the devices selected are FBK near UV HD uh, cryo SIPMs uh, produced by L Foundry, which are uh, one centimeter square in size and with the specifications mentioned here. Uh, the temperature dependent noises of these SIPMs are highly, uh, highly low, uh, significantly low uh, compared to the other technologies for the purpose of cryogenic uh, characterization. So let's now move on to the noise characterization. Here you can see the side cross-sectional uh, view of the SIPM. Uh, showing different kinds of intrinsic noises. Uh, the primary event is triggered due to the thermal agitation, which gives, ri uh, gives rise to the dark count rate. And this can further trigger an avalanche in the neighboring cell instantaneously, producing internal crosstalk or also known as direct crosstalk. Additionally, when a trapped uh, electron or hole is released in the same cell, it is referred to as after pulsing. And if the trapped electron or hole is released in the neighboring cell, uh, it's uh, referred to as delayed crosstalk. So the dominant contribution of noise in SIPMs is mainly uh, due to direct crosstalk and uh, duck count rate. Uh, this is the one centimeter square device we use for our studies. And here you can see the 
uh, pulse spectrum observed at 77 Kelvin uh, that identifies uh, single photoelectron peaks with a single photon resolution. And uh, so these are the results for the dark country and external uh, and uh, internal crosstalk measurements. Uh, we achieved a dark count rate of the order of one millicount per second per millimeter square, uh, which has a negligible effect on our uh, argon scintillation signal. And on the right here is the internal crosstalk, or as I said, a direct crosstalk, uh, studied with, uh, with, uh, with and without the laser illumination. And the quadratic behavior here uh, with the laser illumination is due to the deviation from the pure Poissonian uh, distribution following a geometric chain crosstalk model. And uh, so the, the range uh, in which the internal crosstalk varies is uh, 2 to 10 volts over voltage with 5 to 60% of uh, probability. And now, uh, apart from these uh, intrinsic noises discussed before, uh, we observed uh, that the photons emitted by the SIPMs can be reflected uh, around in the detector medium and can be detected by the other SIPMs. Uh, this in turn triggers an avalanche in the SIPMs and create another source of noise. It is termed as a external crosstalk. And here on the left, uh, you can see a plot showing the light yield of the top array of SIPMs with respect to the bottom one while varying the bottom one on different over voltages. And this was observed uh, in the setup uh, with the SIPM top and bottom arrays facing each other in a small detector filled with liquid argon and uh, reflective walls. Uh, you can see here how the light yield uh, observed at the top array increases exponentially uh, with the over voltage. And this exponential rise is due to the contribution from the external crosstalk. Uh, the true photon detection uh, you can see here in violet. Uh, uh, is, is this violet curve and uh, the rest all rest are all the contributions from the SIPM noises uh, to the light yield. Uh, the key point here uh, to notice is that um, external crosstalk, though a noise factor in SIPMs, has a significantly less impact on the light yield compared to the internal crosstalk. Now to study this uh, anomalous uh, feature in light yield, a dedicated setup to study external crosstalk was designed uh, to be tested in vacuum. Uh, here you can see the picture of the external crosstalk board designed in our lab with four SIPMs and an aluminum cover on the top uh, with uh, different reflectors to, uh, to test their reflectance. And on the right uh, is the lab setup with the SIPM one, two, three, and four marked here. And uh, so to estimate the contribution of the external crosstalk of each SIPM, uh, I performed un unbind maximum likelihood analysis, uh, which is used on multivariate uh, Poisson distribution to extract main parameters, uh, theta one, theta two, th theta three, and theta four, corresponding to the external crosstalk probability of uh, each of the SIPMs respectively, with, uh, with 16 covariance parameters denoted by uh, theta ij. And these are the plots uh, for the derived external crosstalk probability parameter theta for all SIPMs uh, with respect to the source uh, over voltage uh, of the SIPM. And uh, here in the two plots, uh, you can see uh, the fixed target SIPMs at uh, zero over voltage and uh, three volts over voltage. Uh, the important point here to notice is that when the target SIPMs are fixed at three volts over voltage uh, have uh, the uh, the source of SIPM contribution increases uh, with the over voltage, whereas the for for the fixed SIPMs, the fixed target SIPMs, which are these three, uh, the variation is within ten percent uh, with respect to the increasing over voltage. And then uh, there was also a toy Monte Carlo performed on this uh, data to fit the data. Uh, now, moving on to the timing resolution. So uh, due to the increased uh, detector active volume, uh, future detectors would face huge pileup due to uh, background events and limitation uh, of the size of the dual phase TPC gives a poor uh, position reconstruction. Uh, therefore, a, uh, a precise uh, timing resolution becomes an important feature for the position reconstruction. 
So uh, this, this will facilitate uh, particle identification through per shape discrimination to estimate uh, cuts for uh, background event rejection. So to reduce uh, the pileup, a zero pole cancellation technique was applied digitally. And uh, the time uh, jitter distribution is given by the time of uh, laser trigger minus the time of arrival of the one uh, photoelectron signal of the SIPM. Here, uh, you can see the plot, uh, which shows the zero pole filtered uh, signal here. And this is the original signal without any filtering, which is clearly overwhelmed by the dark noise. And whereas you can see that after filtering, uh, the pulse is quite distinguishable. Here are the results for the single photon timing resolution at uh, 300 Kelvin and 77 Kelvin. Uh, we had uh, two different preamplifiers for the SIPMs just to compare the performances. And uh, the timing resolution reaches 150 picoseconds. Uh, at uh, 77 Kelvin, whereas uh, it reaches around 280 picoseconds at uh, 300 Kelvin. Uh, with, now with this um, quantification of uh, noise, noise contributions and timing resolution, uh, uh, we need to know how efficient will be the real photon detection. And for that, we need to move to uh, the next section, which is uh, the photon detection efficiency. So the photon detection efficiency measurements at the cryogenic temperature need to be carried out uh, to have conclusive estimates uh, for the performance of future detectors. Uh, this will help us in creating a profile of the SIPMs uh, cu uh, customized uh, for low energy event reconstruction. Uh, the study of absorption length and uh, depletion region width will be a consequence of these measurements. Uh, with optimum profiling, uh, we will aim to achieve uh, PDE greater than 50%. And here you can see uh, the diagram of P on N SIPM profile with the high field region uh, where the SIPM goes under, undergoes an avalanche. Uh, then you have the active layer and the bulk layer. Uh, the thickness of these regions changes with decreasing temperatures and hence uh, it reduces the efficiency to create uh, avalanches in active layer. And to understand this behavior better, let's understand uh, what is a triggering probability. So the avalanche uh, triggering probability is of a generated uh, electron hole pair to initiate a Geiger mode avalanche inside the depletion layer. Here is the typical formula uh, of the PDE with the fill factor, quantum efficiency, and triggering probability. Uh, while the triggering probability is defined as the following expression with the contributions uh, from electrons and holes. Uh, VE and VH uh, stand for the potential required to create an avalanche with the electron or hole respectively. And PE and PH are the probability of electrons or holes to create an avalanche. Uh, here are the results uh, for the study I did for the triggering probability. Now, the important point is that uh, we obtained these results at a 0.1 level of laser illumination to record mostly uh, 1P events and negligible crosstalk events. And these are the uh, results uh, with a fit, fitted model of uh, the triggering probability at 300 Kelvin and the 77 Kelvin. Uh, the y-axis show here the rate ratio between the mean of the spectrum of one SIPM with respect to the other, which is uh, considered as the mu ref. And uh, the effect you see uh, here in the, uh, in, at uh, 77 Kelvin, the distribution of the curves for different wavelengths is due to the reduction in the depletion region width that affects the triggering probability. Now to understand Here minutes this, over time, if we can wrap up. For... Oh, oh, right, right. Okay, sorry. Yes. Uh, so yeah, you know, just um, to say that uh, in order to model this better, uh, we can uh, incorporate the thickness of the depletion region and absorption length in, in, model, in the PD model to further uh, model the PD at 77 Kelvin. And with this, I come to my conclusions. Uh, so, yes, uh, the noise contribution from the dark count rate was uh, of the order of one millihertz per millimeter square. The, dark, uh, the direct crosstalk was 5 to 60 percent over 2 to 10 volts of voltage. Uh, the measured uh, timing resolution at 77 Kelvin was three, uh, 370 to 160 uh, picoseconds at one sigma level over the range of 4 to 13 volts of voltage. Uh, the 
external cross talk uh, contribution was observed and for SIPM setup, where the source SIPM's contribution starts to dominate with increasing overvoltage. Uh, the triggering probability at 77 Kelvin with the uh, different uh, wavelengths shows uh, the reduction of the depletion region that strongly suppresses the formation of the uh, charge carriers. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions? Uh, sorry, I cannot see the question. I, I don't see any raised hand yet. Okay, we don't have any questions and in the interest of time, I would move uh, directly okay. to the next speaker. Thank you very much. You can stop sharing. Our next speaker is uh, Daniele Pasciuto from ENF and PISA. Hi, everybody. Hello, Daniele. Would you like to start sharing your slides? I'm trying. One second. Okay. Yes. Okay. Can you see my slides? Yes, I can. Okay. I'd like to try a full mode. So I'll start. Uh, I'll try to get this in full mode. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah, uh, I think I can more than this. Perfect. Uh, whenever you're ready, over to you. Okay. So good morning, uh, everybody. Um, I will talk today uh, with a, uh, about a brief report on the development and the construction of the Mitsui electromagnetic calorimeter mechanical structures uh, that we'll uh, at Fermilab in Chicago, close Chicago. So after a short introduction of the experiment, uh, we will give a look to the main components of the calorimeter and uh, it's um, their production status. So uh, Mitsui is a conversion of a muon into an electron in the field of an aluminum uh, atom. The experimental apparatus is very complex. Uh, is, uh, and it is composed by three superconductive uh, solenoids that produce uh, an intense muon beam, uh, which is stopped in the aluminum uh, target. And uh, then a straw tracker and the electromagnetic calorimeter measure the particles in the final state. So the detector solenoid volume is covered by the cosmic uh, uh, ray beta that is uh, not shown uh, in, in this uh, picture, and uh, to reduce uh, cosmic uh, muons induced backgrounds. So Mutui has been completely designed by a large international collaboration, uh, and uh, we are now building it. So the data, the data uh, taking uh, uh, is being expected in uh, two or three years uh, from, from now. And um, today I will talk about the electromagnetic uh, calorimeter that is shown up uh, here in the corner. So let's give a look to this uh, exploded view. Uh, of uh, one disk. So the heart of the detector is the ring shaped the matrix uh, um, of uh, cesium iodide crystals uh, that is in, in the center here. The matrix uh, is supported by the outer ring, the yellow one, and the inner ring, the red one. And the silicon for the multipliers and the front end electronics uh, are uh, placed uh, in the back plane, uh, but they are not still so visible in this, uh, this image. So they're very, very little. The, this, the back plane is positioned back in the very close to the crystal's uh, surface. So the, uh, the external, uh, on the external surface of the disk, uh, we have uh, 10 uh, crates that host the DAQ electronics. And the calibration system uh, exploits a radioactive fluid flowing through a pipe uh, of the net pipes uh, in this uh, source plate that is the front panel of uh, the calorimeter. So the detector uh, operates in vacuum. And for this reason, we developed a ad hoc solution to integrate the cooling system for the electronics in the mechanical structure. And the, here you can find the operational condition uh, such as uh, one Tesla magnetic field and 10 to minus four uh, vacuum. So the CSI crystals are, are now stored at Fermilab in nitrogen fluxed cabinets to avoid the water absorption. We requested from the vendor first and verified next that they, uh, they, they satisfy tight quality criteria in terms of physical and optical uh, performance and geometrical tolerance. Uh, on the linear dimension, they are uh, below 100 microns of error uh, for the short sides and 200 microns uh, for the, the long sides. And 
and uh, the tolerance uh, is also below 100 micron for both uh, perpendicularity and parallelism between the phases. Uh, we have measured all these parameters for each crystal one by one, and uh, it was necessary for um, to be sure that we will be able to keep uh, the geometry of the stack red donut shape matrix uh, under control. We still um, think to have some fine uh, tuning uh, during uh, um, during uh, the assembling process, uh, but we will uh, check uh, that one uh, during operation. So the the main problem of building uh, the matrix of crystal is predicting uh, the effect of stacking so many rows or column of crystals. And we have performed many tests uh, with SEMM uh, to understand the effects of vertical and horizontal stacking and the effects of all the Tyvek and Tedler uh, sheets that uh, wrap all the crystals. So we have developed a simple model to estimate the crystal uh, vertical and horizontal pitches and uh, predict the position uh, of each matrix element, including the extreme elements. To determine the maximum, uh, the matrix envelope and the CPM's uh, location. Thanks to this model, uh, we gained the confidence uh, on the necessary tolerance uh, we should have on the design of the crystal and the CPM support structure. So each crystal uh, will face uh, two Amamatsu wide area silicon uh, photomultiplier grouped together in a single module with a copper holder for optimizing the cooling and thermal control, two front end electronics boards. Uh, see here in the CAD model, and a uh, fiber for flashing, calibrating a laser directly on the crystal face. Uh, for improving the thermal contact, CPMs are glued with a vacuum proof uh, glue on the holder, which is fastened on the back plane cooling lines to make an easy substitution in case of failure. Uh, keep temperature low and steady is very important uh, to reduce dark current uh, noise and to keep uh, CPM gain stable over time. So in the picture here, you can see the uh, gluing process in Frascari in Italy uh, with a custom template. The outer ring is the main support structure of the detector. It is made of a monolithic uh, C-shaped profile um, machined from a whole block of aluminum 6082. Uh, and uh, the internal surface uh, has a stairway to, uh, to position the position of, and, uh, of the crystals. And uh, the two aluminum uh, rings have been uh, built and checked for quality assurance in their dimensions. And the one is a Fermilab, one in Italy for assembly test. About the inner ring, it performs uh, a fundamental function from the alignment of uh, the crystal matrix. It is made of carbon fiber cylinder, uh, cylinder skin, A and uh, two aluminum uh, stiffening uh, uh, rings, the B, and the three um, sandwiches, uh, uh, carbon fiber and aluminum honeycomb uh, on the outer surface uh, to create the steps for uh, the crystal position. So the design um, took in account the request of employing the minimum possible amount of material to minimize uh, particle energy losses, uh, which is a crucial aspect in uh, our experiment. The production of these components uh, is processing well. Uh, the and the moment uh, they assembling uh, all the subcomponents, and here you can see um, also a picture of the dry run that we uh, just made uh, in Italy. So we will expect uh, to adjust uh, the inner ring deformation. To do this, uh, we are uh, realizing uh, we are realizing this uh, um, adjustable fit on the lower surface and um, to spread the load also homogeneously in the crystal below. And uh, we have performed some uh, uh, analytical tests and also some measurements. And we decided to use uh, a G10 screw um, with a um, feet made of a peak to uh, spread the, the, the forces and the carbon fiber uh, reinforcement sheet to protect the crystals. So the front place is the actual front face of the detector. It has the pipes which flow the calibration source. That is an ECF 770 radioactive fluid. Uh, we have employed uh, thin wall aluminum pipes embedded in a carbon fiber uh, sandwich with an aluminum honeycomb core, uh, milled on purpose. Uh, and the, since the front plate is traversed by all the particles with, uh, which uh, hit the calorimeter, material budget uh, was of ex, uh, maximum concern. The pipes have been shipped in Italy, where the assembly will take place, and they have been tested with the helium leak detector. The maximum leak rate uh, measured is below 3 to times 10 to minus uh, 10 millibar liters per second. 
that is the sensitivity of the machine we used. So the um, backplane um, supports the 700, uh, 674 um, front end electronic units, which include the CPM and the front end electronic boards. It is made of a milled uh, pick plate uh, built gluing two smaller plates with a B notch joint because of uh, uh, availability of uh, pick plates, of such big uh, pick plates. Uh, and the pick was chosen to optimize thermal isolation of the electronics and uh, for its good outcasting uh, characteristics. <clears throat> the back plane integrates the cooling system of the front end uh, units uh, and uh, has a network of braised uh, copper lines uh, flowing HFE uh, 7100 fluid at minus uh, 15 degrees Celsius. The lines run in parallel between the input and the output manifold in the outer, in the outer region. And uh, it is made to uh, maximize the temperature uniformity over the, uh, all the CPMs. We have performed some thermal tests uh, uh, test in NF and uh, laboratories in PISA, uh, as you can see from the infrared thermal camera, uh, the picture here. And um, also we have measured all the CPMs uh, hollow uh, to avoid any uh, interference during assembling. The DAQ crates are placed on the external surface of the calorimeter and uh, they uh, host the DAQ boards. At the same time, they cool, uh, they cool them. To reduce uh, the crate envelope and to optimize uh, the thermal performance, we embedded the cooling lines in the lateral walls. Um, and uh, um, also, uh, we have used uh, some tungsten shield on the front surface to protect them from radiation, from the board from the radiation. The fluid uh, has, um, runs uh, in, the in the main manifold and uh, has been distributed by this S-shaped uh, tubing to um, allow adjusting during uh, assembly. The, the crates also uh, has embedded the, the, front, the cable holding system, as you can see in this, uh, in, uh, in this mock-up we, we performed at the Fermi lab. So CREATE have, uh, have been tested singularly for any fluid losses, and the uh, company is now finalizing the welding of the all uh, S-shaped uh, CREATE connection. In, the, in this picture, you can see a dry run of the CREATE assembling in uh, Frascari. Each CREATE uh, must remove uh, uh, 40 watt uh, per uh, DAQ board and keep the maximum temperature below the limit of a safe of, um, operation <clears throat> for the electronics components. To achieve these results, uh, we have uh, realized the copper plate uh, and uh, it has been installed on top of the um, of each board with a vacuum proof for grease, the episode. And, um, and in this way, uh, we can uh, better dissipate uh, the power and um, from the most heated component. Boards and plates are locked in the crate with a special card locks uh, to create a good thermal contact uh, in vacuum and uh, we co um, and also magnetic uh, compatible. So the we have uh, made some uh, thermal tests on the simulator and also uh, made some uh, therm thermal simulation and we also made some thermal tests in vacuum uh, where, where we measured all the uh, temperature of the, uh, we reached in the CPMs and everything is go going good uh, right now. So to conclude, uh, it took many years to design uh, the mutually uh, electromagnetic calorimeter mechanical structures, and uh, we are almost done. The most of the parts have already been built and uh, tested, and some of them are already at Fermilab now. Other parts are still being built, but uh, not so much far in time. And uh, here you can see some some other pictures about the laboratory, the clean room where the assembly will take place uh, in. Uh, uh, in, at Sidet at Fermilab, uh, the assembling uh, uh, and the, uh, the assembling of the peak plate and the uh, outer aluminum ring uh, we made in Italy, uh, where we performed some uh, a measurement uh, about the coupling. And here we are making some tests about the uh, the next step, that is the cable routing of all the front end electronics uh, uh, cables and the laser, uh, the distribution of the laser system. Thanks for your attention. Thank you. Do we have any questions?
You say those frames were transported to Fermilab. Um, how difficult was the transportation? Like, uh, are you aware of any difficulties? Uh, in... It wasn't uh, and something that we did not consider the first time because of COVID, because all the assembling uh, should have take place uh, in uh, at Fermilab in the first step. Yeah. But because of COVID uh, and the Italian, um, the Italian collaboration could move uh, so easily between the US and uh, and Italy. So we prefer to have some test in Italy about assembling. But next we will dismount everything back and we ship separately because all the pipes and the joints uh, um, are about we have concern about do not break anything during transportation. That is not so good usually. <laughs> They also, uh, we have also lost some items during transportation between the US and the Italy. So we have to manufacture like the, these pipes here, okay. they've been, been made twice because the first shipment was lost. Yeah. So we have to, now we also install some GPS in packaging to take track of our packages during shipping. There are all kinds of horror stories with transportation of uh, sensitive detectors and support structures. Yeah. I, I assume, what was this project impacted in any way by COVID apart from the transportation and uh, the additional? Uh, we, I think we lost two years. Goodness. <laughs> because uh, we were almost ready to construct everything in the US, but we were stopped about that. Um, maybe we were not the bottleneck of this, project so the other parts of these other items were impacted most in uh, delay time delay mm -hmm. but we adjust our time schedule to to be in line with the other one we have more time to test everything to design better uh, so we prefer to be slower since we have more time okay uh, and what is the time scale maybe you said but like what is the time this scale? is this is the this is uh, so we are uh, we have a, um, we are expecting to build everything to start building uh, at Fermilab everything uh, in the next months uh, if COVID uh, uh, permits to travel and do not stop anything back uh, and so we expect to finalize uh, the mounting of all the components and also our uh, colleagues in the end of this year the next year. And so we have just to assembly all together. And so this this is the reason why 23, 24, expecting oh. the data. Thank you. Do we have any other questions to Daniela? No, then uh, thanks Daniela for your uh, talk. Uh, Thank you. Can stop sharing. And we can move to our next speaker, uh, Stephen Dolan from CERN. Uh, who would speak about a polystyrene-based scintillator production process involving additive manufacturing. Okay, um, hopefully you can hear me okay. Uh, we can hear you, we can see you, your slides are full screen, so when you're ready, over to you. Okay, perfect. So first of all, thank you very much to the organizers for, uh, for inviting us to give this talk. So as was said, I'm going to be discussing uh, a polystyrene-based scintillator production process involving additive manufacturing uh, I, on behalf of the 3 debt collaboration. Uh, okay, so first of all, why are we interested in any of this in the first place? Well, uh, massive scintillator detectors, uh, which are, are, are becoming more and more prevalent, and in particular, massive scintillator detectors, which have increasingly complicated geometries. Uh, for example, they find large use as neutrino active targets, as neutron detectors, and also as calorimeters. As some examples, you can see uh, a, the solid detector here, which is a, a detector to, to, to detect neutrinos coming from uh, nuclear reactors. And then you have this scintillated cubic structure read out by the two planes of wavelength shifting fibers uh, with the photosensors at the end in order to, uh, to, to, to catch the sort of detail of the, of the neutrino interaction products. You also have... Uh, have the, uh, the such complicated detector ge ge geometries and things like uh, the design of the June near detector calorimeter, which is based actually on the CALIS calorimeter designed for the ILC, which is uh, based on very small scintillating slabs stacked in layers. 
and then one particular example I just want to go through because it sort of uh, will will highlight uh, the importance of sort of moving beyond standard scintillated uh, detector manufacturer techniques, which is the T2K new near detector called the Super FGD, which uh, thanks to its geometry, which I'll mention in the next slide, is able to give almost photographic images of uh, neutrino interactions. You can see the sort of details you can get in the plot in the bottom right there. So just as one example to show the importance of, uh, of as I said, moving beyond traditional manufacturing methods, I want to show uh, this super FTD concept from the T2K experiment. So the previous detectors that were being used were based on this sort of standard concept where you have scintillated bars read out at one end by uh, with a with a, a fiber going through them read out by uh, at one end by a silicon photosensor, uh, but and then these bars will be stacked in planes in order to give you some tracking. But uh, the Super FGD goes much beyond this, and it kind of it's inspired a little by the design of Solid that has these scintillated uh, cubes. But this time they're very small scintillating cubes; they're just one centimeter cubic, and they're read out in all three directions. This gives uh, this this offers a lot of improvements over the old FGD concept, offering four pi acceptance, better tracking thresholds, improved resolution, and even involves it allows the measurements of neutron kinematics. But I'm just discussing this as an example and to show you that this is this is an excellent detector uh, in in terms of its physics performance, but it's the assembly is extremely complicated. You can see here that it needs 2 million of these one centimeter cubic scintillating cubes. You can see it's uh, here it is uh, partially assembled in, in two parts. And you can see that each of uh, each kind of tiny cube here, you can see just how many there are, how difficult it is to, to stack all of these things together, and then to thread 58,000 wavelength shifting fibers through the entire thing. So using standard assembly methods this was doable but if we wanted but it was challenging and if we want to go any larger we probably need to move beyond standard assembly methods of really uh, assembly in almost a, a, a careful tetris like way these one centimeter cubic cubes so additive manufacturing uh, which is what we're interested in the 3d collaboration may provide a viable means to actually uh, to a few to produce future uh, large detectors with such complicated geometries that these one centimeter cubic cubes so the three deck collaboration aims to sort of confront this problem. Uh, it stands for three D printed detector uh, collaboration, and we're investigating using additive manufacturing as a new productive uh, production technique for future scintillated detectors. This is really, at the moment, uh, general purpose research and development towards producing the first three D printed particle detector with performances that will be comparable to state of the art uh, traditional methods of scintillated manufacturing. Uh, 3 deck comprises uh, these four institutions here, uh, which allows the collaboration to benefit from quite a wide range of expertise from uh, from particle detector development, but also we've got, uh, got, got collaborators at, for example, ISMO, which are experts in scintillated materials, and so we can come together to, to try and combine our expertise in order to, to produce 3D printed detectors. Uh, I'll answer any questions uh, you have here as best I can, but the contact person for the collaboration uh, is Davide and the technical coordinator is Uma. I provide their contact details here if you would like to follow up at all. So what's the idea? Well, to, we start by looking at the uh, kind of standard method or the most common method of 3D printing, the so-called fused decom uh, dep deposition modeling. This is a kind of 3D printer uh, technology you may have seen before, where the idea is that you have uh, you have material filaments, thread, uh, fed through a heater uh, and into an, exclu uh, an extrusion nozzle where they're, they're printed out on a surface and then assembled in layers. You can see a little idea of how this works and how it can work with multiple materials in the bottom left animation here. But you can see you can deposit one layer of material and then other layers on top of that existing layer. So it's line by line assembly using filaments fed into extrusion nozzles. Uh, this technology allows you to 3D print large volumes quite quickly. And as I said, it allows you to use multiple materials as you can have multiple nozzles. It provides, it, it's, a, it's a robust method of manufacture and it's also relatively cheap. We've found that it allows a high transparency of scintillated manufacture, though I'll say more about that in a moment. One of the neat things that we can do here, though, to try and build our detector, and this is the sort of ultimate aim, is that you can 3D print uh, at the same time not only the scintillator material, but also the optically isolating reflector around it. So you can start by just printing a cube with a reflector around it if you want, but then you don't have to just stop there and just have to uh, assemble one by one those cubes like we did with the Super FGD. Instead, we could assemble, we could print an entire layer of optically isolated cubes together, or we could even go further and try and print an entire sort of super cube uh, all within the 3D printer. Uh, okay, so to start with this, of course, we need to be able to 3D print uh, scintillated though. So how do we do that? 
So we start with our, our scintillator filament. You can see it actually sitting on a spool here under a UV light, so you can, can see what it looks like. We tried. To, uh, we wanted to start with something very well known, so we uh, we took polystyrene and then the the uh, the activator and the shifter, uh, but found that this on its own would be too brittle to go through the uh, the, the sort of FDM uh, procedure. It would it would break, and so we add a uh, five percent biphenyl as a plasticizer in order to make the material suitable for FDM. Of course, the more non scintillating things you add into your your scintillator, the less your light yield is going to be, and also uh, this can also affect the transparency. So we, we try producing scintillator with different types of plasticizers with different degrees. You can see that you, you, it does have the potential to degrade the transparency. You've got no plasticizer on the left, and you've got you've you've got different uh, di di different uh, pr propositions for for different plasticizers as you go along. What we find is just with five percent biphenyl, we find that the, the 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 light output really isn't reduced too much. It's what you're seeing in this plot here. Uh, but it gives us the sort of malleability of the scintillator filament that's required for the FDM procedure. Now we're working though with the base uh, chemical composition being the uh, pulp being polystyrene. So we're working with something that's very well known and it's been deployed in particle detectors many times before. So there's no need to invent any new chemical composition for this 3D printing of scintillator detectors. Uh, it, uh, we can just use uh, well-established material. So the proof of concept is first of all, can we actually 3D print uh, a, a little scintillator cube? Uh, what we found is that if you if you immediately print the cube and you look at what you get, you see it actually doesn't look so great. It looks like you've got a not very transparent uh, material, but it's actually just the surface that has this issue and it, it's characteristic of FDM and the way the material cools. So if you polish the outside of the cube you get here, you get something which is very nice and transparent. So we're able to get a, a very high tra transparency here. And th th so this isn't so much of a problem. We then produce scintillator cubes using this method and also using standard techniques. And then we can compare the light yield we get uh, for uh, under cosmic and source exposure and make a comparison of, of how our 3D printed cube compares with other methods of scintillator manufacture. Uh, in each of these cases, I should point out the photosensor is coupled directly with the cube. There's no fibers or anything. So when we do this, we find that under an exposure to, uh, exposure to cosmics, there's there's nothing really to tell between the different scintillator manufacturing technologies, which is good. So our 3D printed uh, uh, cube is, is is working as well as uh, as traditionally produced cubes. When we look to source exposure, you see that the 3D printed cube does. Uh, so this is uh, the x-axis here is number of a a ADC counts, uh, and you can see that we, we do fall off a little earlier, but it, it's 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 really not a very dramatic change, uh, and it is comparable to other scintillator detector techniques. So this is very positive, and this. Uh, to read more about any of that, you, you can have a look at the first paper from this collaboration, uh, which, which reported on this sort of proof of concept. Everything else, else I say in this talk, we're going beyond that. So the first thing that uh, we looked at was, of course, we can produce different ge geometries as well. We can produce long bars of scintillator. So you can see an example here of a long bar of scintillator produced using three different techniques with our 3D printed scintillator at the bottom. And you can see maybe it isn't quite so transparent as the other two. But what we found is that we can actually, there's the, the exact way in which you print the scintillator can has a little bit of freedom. And so what we found is we could optimize some of the printing properties in order to, uh, to, to achieve a reasonable attenuation length. We got down to a we got to a 20 centimeter attenuation length at the moment, but there's scope for improvement. What you can see is that uh, what we actually could do is uh, to try and avoid air bubbles forming uh, in the printing procedure, uh, which affects the transparency, uh, we can aim for a higher fill factor, but it's really a balance. If you want a very high fill factor, so you don't have any air bu bubbles, you, you might compromise a little your geometrical tolerance. So there's there's a careful game of optimization that can be played in order to try and optimize your, your scintillator detector uh, transparency. You can see that in the optimization that was done, we were able to get uh, uh, the, the performance of the scintillator improved uh, sig sig significantly when looking through the long bar. You can see that we went from uh, really plateauing way uh, really dipping, sorry, way below the the other scintillator production techniques. Uh, when uh, before we made our optimization, after the optimization, we have something much more comparable. We still find though that when we look to our, our updated scintillator bar, which is what you can see here, uh, it has still got some air bubbles in it. So there is some scope for improvement by further fine tuning the printing process. That is ongoing development. So I mentioned. Uh, so that's that's the printing the. The, the scintillator, but we want to be able to, pre uh, to 3D print the optical reflector as well. And as I discussed earlier, the FDM procedure that we're using is perfectly capable of multi-material printing. 
So we uh, we develop an optical reflector where we use uh, something pretty standard. We take polymer pellets, we add a reflective, a reflective pigment, we extrude them to get reflect, a reflective filament that we can then use as a second filament in the 3D printing procedure. You can see the printing in process here where you're actually printing up the cubes and the filament as you go along. And so this gives us access to multi-material printing. What we aim it for is a 10 millimeter thick scintillator and a one millimeter thick reflector. We check the properties of the 3D printed reflector and we find that it's pretty good. So we're in the relevant uh, region of uh, uh, the, the relevant wavelengths, about around 420 nanometers, we find that the, the reflectivity we're getting from our 3D printed uh, uh, optical reflector is comparable with other technologies. If you actually look at it as a table, you see that whilst the 3D printing isn't quite as high as other, uh, as, uh, as, as, uh, other options, it's absolutely high enough for deployment in a detector. So we can now actually uh, put this all together. We can 3D print our scintillator. We can 3D print our uh, uh, optically isolating uh, material around it. And we produce this little two by two matrix and this three by three matrix here. The, you can see it under the UV light there. So you can nicely see this, the scintillation. So uh, this, we managed to successfully complete this printing. Uh, what you can see, uh, if you look carefully, is that the outer surface uh, has some non-uniformities. And this is, again, related to the fact that you've got high, to high temperature printing and then it cools. But the, the inner part won't have any of these pr problems. So what we, uh, and it's, it's ultimately the, the, the inner part that's important for physics performance. So this is a good thing. We find that within the inner part, we have a tolerance of the reflector thickness and the cube shape of around half uh, a millimeter, which is, is, is absolutely acceptable. Uh, however, we do find if we look carefully that uh, very close to the boundary that there's some uh, reflector elements found within the scintillator, which obviously reduces the transparency and reduces the scintillation performance. But uh, so there is still scope for improvement by again fine tuning the printing parameters. Uh, though we can take what we have at the moment and we can actually look at the performance of it. So our, our little 3D printed uh, scintillator detector, we can we can uh, instrument it in a very simple way. So we we have a box here. We have photo sensors on one side side of the box. We have a uh, a uh, little 3D printed detector on the other side of the box. You close the box and we've got a photosensors coupled to the uh, scintillator. Uh, we then put this box on top of uh, another box uh, of multiple layers of scintillating cubes with a well understood response, which allows us to, uh, to, to, to trigger on cosmic rays uh, in order to, to, to understand the response of the box here. We, we also expose it to source data as well. Uh, so when we go and do this, we can make some preliminary me measurements that come out to be pretty promising. We measure uh, a absolutely acceptable light output of 45 photo el electrons, and we importantly measure a low optical crosstalk probability as well of only around 2%. This is important as we needed to check that the the, the printing of the optical isolation really didn't have any holes in it or anything, and we were able to to uh, to, to make sure we, we had a, a good optical seal between the cubes, and we found that indeed that we do. So this is uh, the, the, this is a very promising performance. So this is really where we're up to so far. We've demonstrated the feasibility of 3D printing plastic scintillator detectors using this fused uh, decomposition method to simultaneously print both the scintillator and the optical reflector together. With further research and development, hopefully uh, we, we, we hope that in the end, 3D printing might allow an easier and potentially cheaper realization of complex detector geometry for future physics applications. And uh, we found that the performances of our 3D printed elements in the cube matrix uh, are actually comparable to that using standard manufacturing techniques. So this is this is all looking good. However, we want to eventually go further. Uh, I kept saying that there's this scope for optimization and fine tuning. And so further research and development is expected to improve performance. We think we can get to better transparency. We think we can improve the geometrical tolerances as well. We're also looking at alternative methods of 3D printing compared to fused decomposition modeling. And one thing we hope to achieve uh, in, in the long run is to leave holes uh, so as, as you're printing the detector upwards, you can leave holes for fibers to be thread through such that after your 3D printing, you really don't have to do much at all before you've got a detector which can have the fibers for thread through, which can be deployed and which can be immediately used as a, as, as a kind of rapid assembly of a particle detector. That's everything from me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, do we have any questions? Uh, hi, I have a couple of questions. Go ahead. So which temperature do you print uh, the materials? And uh, which uh, 3D printer you are using, are you using for these uh, tasks? Okay, so that bit isn't something that I've worked in explicitly, sorry. So I might refer you to our, uh, to our technical coordinator of UMAT there. Uh, I, the, the, uh, so yeah, I, 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 I don't want to guess numbers, so I, I'll have to refer you, sorry. 
No worry, thanks. Do you have another question? Okay, uh, Tristan. Yeah. Hi, Stephen. Uh, thanks for the really nice talk. I was just wondering, is, has there been any study into the like long-term reliability of the printing process for a big project like the Super FGD? I just know, like, I have my own 3D printer and the thought of printing two million of anything is quite <laughs> scary. Uh, so one thing is, I guess, in terms of long time reliability is the scintillator aging. And that's something that we're discussing where we're, we're currently looking into and trying to check that the, the aging properties of the scintillator don't differ substantially from the, the state of the art that we usually has, have. And indeed, as examples for the, in the TTK detectors, obviously, the, the making sure that the scintillator doesn't age badly is important. Uh, and uh, uh, so in terms of long term reliability, in terms of the aging, that that should be OK. We also need to obviously check the uh, the, the 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 sort of robustness of what you're printing as you go to, uh, to, to 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 larger and larger scales. But the idea is hopefully that you won't ever need to be printing kind of two million of those cubes. You'll be able to print, as I kind of showed back at the beginning, a uh, a sort of whole you could print kind of a whole block of the detector at once and then assemble the detector in blocks eventually uh so it, it, you you don't have to be dealing with such sort of tiny elements as you did for the assembly of the super ftd yeah and and on that i think it relates to the final bullet point on the last slide with printing with the holes for the wavelength shift in fiber you showed on slide seven that the uh, outer service needed to be polished. So is there any ideas for how you can either avoid that or implement that if you're leaving holes for the fibers? Uh, this is still definitely uh, active R&D. So I, I mean, we, we find that the polishing, uh, I, I mean, the, 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 the measurements that we've made suggest that you, you don't need to, you, you don't have this problem kind of between, uh, within the, uh, you don't have this problem, for example, between the scintillator and the optically and, and the the optical isolation. But indeed, when you leave the holes, that potentially could become part uh, a, a problem. And so, yeah, that would be something we will need to to in, investigate. We, we don't. I don't have a, a a complete answer whether or not we can deal with that yet. The the through the sort of leaving space for the holes is, is still very much. Uh, I, it, it, it's really just starting in terms of the R and D. Okay. Thanks. And yeah, thanks again for the talk. The prospect of 3D printing detectors is very exciting. Thank thanks. You. Thank you. Marcos? Uh, yes, uh, this is a very nice R&D. I have just a question. Do you, during the printing, are you under a neutral atmosphere uh, to avoid oxidation of the, of the scintillator? Again, sorry, it's the, the actual 3D printing itself isn't something I was involved in uh, as much. So I would refer you to Uma to answer that question, sorry. Okay. Okay. Uh, I had a question on the poss possibility of uh, printing of the filament. You had it on slide five. Yes. Uh, oh, oh no, it was slide six, I think. Sorry. Oh yeah. So, do, do you know? I mean, have has it been? Right, I, I didn't understand like and if yes like what kind of non-uniform it is you would expect my I'm, I'm asking because I know my colleagues from the scintillating fiber tracker they were very worried about any little bumps uh, in the scintillating fiber so any kind of non-uniformities would obviously matter uh, yeah so I, I mean because so as this goes, uh, as the material is deposited through the 3D printers, printing, you you obviously melt it and then you deposit it there. So the exact non-uniformities you get when you put, uh, as you do the printing, will depend exactly on the printing parameters that you, you have here. And sort of an example of non-uniformities, I guess, is exactly the air bubbles that we were observing mm -hmm. when we were trying to, uh, and, and, and you can kind of see them under the UV light here, uh, yeah. as we were trying to 3D print the, the the little bars that we have here and so the, the yeah there is scope for non-uniformities but by by the, the exact non-uniformity the the extent 
to which you get them can be could, can be minimized and optimized by fine tuning the printing parameters. So fine tuning exactly the temperature that you're applying as uh, as they get printed, uh, exactly the nozzle you're using. Yeah, there's there's this scope to be able to to, uh, to 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 improve on what we have at the moment. But you can see the performance we have at the moment is 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 good. Okay, thank you very much. Any further questions? If not. Thanks, Stephen, again for your uh, very nice talk. Uh, you can stop sharing. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I would like to invite our next speaker, uh, Sao Lan Wu from the University of Wisconsin Madison. And uh, she will speak about the application of quantum artificial intelligence and machine learning to high energy physics analysis at LHC using. Using. Thank you. Um, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, so I will start talking about the application of quantum machine learning to high energy physics analysis at LHC. We'll be using quantum computer simulators and quantum computer hardware. I will address the challenges and opportunity in this study. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so we have assembled an international and interdisciplinary team of high energy physicists and, uh, and compute. Um, quantum computing scientists. We are from University of Wisconsin Physics Department, Computer um, Sciences Department, a CERN Quantum um, Technology Initiative, the IBM Research Zurich and IBM Watson Lab. And we have uh, from Fermilab Quantum Institute and also um, from Brookhaven Computational Science Initiative and University of Stony Brook. And finally, we collaborate with Amazon. Sorry, I over more one thing. Um, so the machine learning in high energy physics, I should introduce to you first. The classical one, we use this booster decision tree called BDT, support vector machine, SVM, and also neural network. So our study will be using quantum computer to compare the result of the classical machine learning of these three particular algorithms. So the um, so the two um, sorry I'm having some problem. Um, so our goal is to perform LXC hydro physics analysis uh, with the quantum machine learning to explore and demonstrate the potential quantum computers. Can it be a new computational paradigm for uh, high energy physics? So the, uh, our present program to use three different quantum machine learning method. Method one is called variational quantum classifier method. Method two is quantum support vector machine kernel method. Number three is the popular uh, new network method. We apply these three methods to two LXC flagship analysis. One is the so-called TTH, the other is the Higgs to mu mu. The next one. So the For the TTH, the process is the Higgs boson production is associated with two top quarks. 
is done by Atlas and CMS co um, collaborations, and they confirm the interaction between the Higgs to the top hawk. And in the picture, you can see from the classical analysis, we see a peak uh, for the Higgs mass. So the class uh, using the classical algorithm of booster decision trees, uh, we compare, we will compare with our performance a quantum computer. This study uh, are using a so-called Delphi simulation sample and quantum machine learning. Next. So the one is um, the second example, the hex to mu mu. And hex to mu mu is a, a very important channel. It will give you the, uh, to prove the coupling between the hex to a second generation fermion. And both CMS and Atlas so far have observed two to three sigma. However, we would like to reach to five sigma. Again, for Atlas, we use the boosted decision tree. So for the method one, we use we use the variational quantum classifier to apply to TTH and hex to mu mu. So in 2018, a variational quantum classifier method was introduced by IBM, published in Nature. So this method can be summarized in four steps. I will be very brief. Uh, we apply the feature map to encode the input data, classical input data, to quantum state. Then we apply uh, short depth quantum variation of circuits. And then we uh, measure the qubit state. And finally, we assign for each event a signal or background. When we do this study, we usually have two data sets. One is for training, one is for testing. Let me give you some uh, definition. One is a core rock curve, and this, this curve shows the background rejection versus the signal efficiency. And uh, the area under this rock curve is called AUC. And so these two, the, both the curve and AUC, are the standard metrics for machine learning application. So here's the result for method one. We use the um, we use the method one, which is giving on the left. You can see that um, using ten qubit TTH analysis and one hundred events, you uh, the red curve is the quantum simulation curve. The other two curve is the BDT, the classical BDT and classical SVM. And you can see the performance are very similar. So we managed to use the quantum simulator um, to match, to have the performance similar to the classical BDT and SVM. On the right is the same thing using the example of hex to mu mu. And on the table, you can see the AUC, the area under the rock curve are very similar results. So the next one is the result of the hardware. And so on the left, we use the IBM hardware 100 events with 10 qubits 
again, it's uh, the hardware result is very similar to the uh, quantum simulation result. On the right is the example of Higgs 2 mu mu. Again, the hardware result very similar to the simulation result, which we consider a really success. However, the hardware running time for 100 events is 200 hours. So this is one of, of our limitation. Now I go to second method using quantum support vector machine kernel method. This one we apply to TTH. This method uh, was also published by IBM in Nature. So the first thing we map the classical data to quantum states, and then we we calculate the similarity between two events, and finally we construct a uh, separating hyperplane to tell which event is signal, which event is background. So our result is shown here. Uh, the red curve is the quantum computing simulation using this kernel method. And the other curve is from uh, BDT and the SVM to classical um, algorithm calculation. So using 15 qubit, 20,000 events, we find the perform performance of the quantum simulation and the classical simulation are similar. Notice that here, this method two, we use 20,000 events, where method one, we use only 100 events. So this, curve, this plot shows that using the algorithm from Google, from IBM, and from Amazon, all give identical results. So here is a curve. Here's a curve for comparison of the IBM hardware, which is the red curve, uh, compared with the IBM algorithm simulation using quantum simulation. So the, the performance is somewhat uh, lower for the hardware than the simulation. But here for 100 events when the hardware, it took uh, only 11 hours. So this method is much faster. So method, method three, we use the quantum neural network applied to TTH analysis. So the um, so in this this case, we com combine the neural network algorithm with the quantum computing. So um, in the example we're doing, we use a hybrid method. One layer is classical, second layer is quantum, the third layer is classical again. And the result is shown here. <clears throat> again, you can see the quantum uh, algorithm simulation have very similar results from the classical neural net and the BDT. So for the hardware, it's impressive. With 100 event 10 qubit, we obtained the IBM hardware result basically similar to the noise, no noise simulation, quantum simulation. But for this one, 100 event would actually took 384 hours. So now I come to the summary. And we have used three methods of quantum machine run, learning. Method one is called variational quantum classifier. We have published our results. Method two is quantum support vector machine kernel method. Again, we have published our results this year. And the third method 
is a quantum new method we are still in progress. And these three methods apply to two LHC uh, flagship analysis, TTH, where H, uh, H go to two gamma, and then H go to two muon. My second summary, our results, both for simulation hardware, demonstrates that quantum machine learning can have the ability to differentiate the signal and background in a realistic physics data set. For the future development, we have to investigate further and hopefully we can see quantum machine learning outperform classical machine learning. In particular, when we have more qubits to be used. Furthermore, future quantum computer may offer speed up in quantum machine learning, which could be very crucial for high energy community, especially for, uh, for the high luminosity LXC. So what are the challenges? The difficulty right now, we only use 100 events for the hardware job due to limited access. And we can only study 10 to 15 qubits in the hardware job due to limitation in circuit length and, and so on. So to use quantum computer hardware for machine learning in the future, high lumia LC physics analysis, we need to demonstrate we can deal with very large number of events and using much more qubits. As, as of today, the maximum number of hardware qubit that I know of, IBM have 127 and Google 54. So demonstrate the future quantum computer we need to demonstrate that they can speed up in the quantum computer. I'm confident in the near future, the quantum machine learning method can demonstrate in, in right now, at least in simulation, this quantum advantage. That means a quantum computing, quantum machine learning can uh, do better than classical machine learning. So what are the opportunity now? From the roadmap presented by IBM Google, it is expected quantum hardware in the future will reduce noise, achieve a performance close to no noise quantum simulation. In addition, they are working very hard to make the speed up of quantum hardware running time. Let me, to be specific, specifically industry roadmap or quantum hardware pro project uh, exponential growth of number of qubits. And that their high fidelity quantum computer will be available in the next 10 years. For example, from the roadmap, IBM expect more than a thousand qubits by 2023 and millions qubits soon after. I and Q, this com company expect to have quantum computer with more than 1000 qubits available with, no, with error corrected by 2028. Google plan to build um, quantum computer with more than 1 million qubit by 2029. These roadmap, roadmaps are evolving very rapidly. I may be out of day soon. And the, the, the promised progress is very impressive. With large investment in quantum computing by the governments, and uh, fierce international competi uh, competitions in technology, this expected opportunity, I think, is realistic. 
So let me conclude. Advanced quantum computer, computers with large number of qubits, reduce noise and improve running time may outperform classical machine learning in both classification power and in speed. Quantum machine learning may well be the new computational paradigm for big data analysis in high energy physics. For this reason, the high energy physics community should stay away or, uh, aware of what is happening in quantum technologies. The improvement in hardware, the software and algorithm should be noticed to bring quantum advantage to high energy data challenge. Conversely, the development of solution unique for high energy data challenges could also lead to contribution to the development of quantum technology. This is a quotation uh, by me and my colleague Xinjiu, which is published, will be published in Challenge and Opportunity in Quantum Machine Learning for High Energy Physics in the March 2022 issue of Nature, which is coming out very soon. So my last uh, slide is a new project. We are working to ex exploit unsupervised machine learning for anomaly detection using quantum computer to search for new physics. New physics can be probed in the form of anomaly detection searches using autoencoder algorithm, for example. So thank you very much. That's, that's what I have. Thank you. Uh, it was a very exciting opportunity. Uh, do we have any questions? Okay, it seems like the speed up is real with the quantum computing. You mentioned uh, you've tested it uh, on a couple of Higgs analysis. Presumably, was it with Atlas? Yes, yes, right. Is, is there any plan of making that, that somehow cross-experiment and uh, work with more of the experiments, uh, either existing or future? Well, um, I should admit that right now, the study I'm doing it is using, you know, the other analysis um, strategy because I am, my group is part of the analysis. However, right now we, we are not in a position to use the Atlas data until the data become old become an open access. So, um, so once, once the open access data is available, I think it would be great if we Atlas and CMS can together combine the quantum computing, uh, quantum machine learning result to see how far we get. Okay. Um, do we have, you have a question from James as well? Hi, Salam. Thank you. Thank you for this very interesting talk and, and these studies. I, I was wondering how how constraining do you find the the the, the output limitation? So the, the need to have you know the number of, of features being equal to the number of qubits, or or is that a bit hard to say when you can only use a hundred events? Is is that more the the limiting factor at the moment rather than the size of the the, the number of features you can pass down? Well, I think the things that we have learned, if we have more features, then we may um, do better. We may be able to beat BDT. Right now we run into um, a sort of a block, the, um, blocking like by the wall, that no matter how high we work with the quantum machine learning, BDT, the classical one, do just as well. But we are confident that when went for larger, uh, for the future, I would see 
we when we have a lot of features and uh, events are more complicated then quantum computer with the speed up would do better. Do I answer your question? Hello? Hello? I, 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 I wasn't sure I answered you. Yeah, I, no, I think I, I, I think you're, I think I, I am. Mean, I, I think you did. Yeah, I agree, I agree with you. So as you say, it's, you probably, I, th I think you're probably right that that you know you wouldn't you you need it to be to be to be faster and have more uh, more events to use more features i think that that's, that's it makes sense right the more feature we have the more uh qubit advantage we're going to get mm -hmm. so i believe it when the, right now our problem is that even ibm has a hundred qubit we are not able to use it we can our study only up to 15 qubits, mm. but that I think will improve. And we just have to learn more how to do it. But our problem is really access to the IBM hardware. Mm. And we cannot get access to Google hardware. And any other hardware will be very expensive. But IBM hardware, we are able to access because US government have paid IBM for the access of the hardware. But we are still, you know, quite far from learning how to use it efficiently. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thank you, Saolan. Uh you can stop sharing uh, and i would like to invite uh, our next speaker thank you uh, thank you very much uh, our next speaker is uh, valentin folkl from cern and he would speak about uh, a common software for future colliders the key for hep turnkey software stack hi uh, i hope you can hear me okay yes i seem i'm just trying to share my screen i hope I think my Zoom software has a quick hiccup at the moment. I might have to ask you to, to share my slides. All right. If that's possible. Apologies for that. Just a second. I need to bring them up, but it should be possible. Ah, no, I think uh, now it's, it's, it's possible. You manage? Okay. Ah, yes. I, got them uh, I hope you. Okay. <laughs> sorry about this. Yes, no so, problem. Uh, yeah, I hope you okay. can uh, see my slides now. Uh, I, I want to thank as well the organizers for inviting me to talk about the Key for Hep uh, project here, which is a common software for future colliders. And I want to start with uh, fairly obvious points. So, what we call a full simulation for uh, for detectors is a fairly complex workflow and that's a very time intensive work to to develop this kind of software and uh, for future especially for future detectors i'm mainly talking about the lhc and lab uh, successors that are that are currently considered this is of course a very huge task um, and the second point is uh, basically very well illustrated by this this plot i have in the bottom corner here um, which is that um, basically is Moore's, Moore's law, the, the famous Moore's law that says uh, the chip manufacturers do manage to get an exponential increase in the number of transistors on processors. Uh, however, as, as you can see for the last uh, two decades or so, uh, this uh, exponential increase in transistor doesn't really uh, translate to an exponential increase in single thread performance or clock frequency, which is basically the things that we uh, usually care about, which is what makes our software faster. Instead, we get uh, additional number of, uh, of cores in the processors, basically, which give us the possibility to do more things in parallel. Uh, but to really, we are still in a very fortunate position in high energy physics, as our, our workflows tend to be very parallelizable in the sense that we can just uh, process events in parallel. But still to exploit this, this, these developments in hardware now so that we, we can still do efficient computing in 10, 20, 30 years, uh, this really needs to, 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 we really need to invest in software development to, to use basically these parallel uh, capabilities. 
uh, one, one advantage in some sense is that for future colliders, we don't need all features right away. So does uh, running experiments, of course, have to deal with, uh, uh, with uh, things like conditions, data alignment. Uh, but I want to stress that, that this, this is, of course, also needed in, in the software for future colliders. But we, we do have kind of like we need to, to design for it. And but it does give us a bit of extra time to do this. So the key for her project is basically the, an effort uh, to get a common experiment software for these future colliders. It's, it wants to, to make a software stack that connects and extends packages to provide a complete data processing framework uh, to do things like uh, full detector simulation. And it should comprise a fast full simulation, which are typically needed for, for these kind of future detector studies, reconstruction and analysis. The main contributors are the, the different future collider communities, namely the future circular collider, both for, for the hadron hadron and electron lepton flavors, uh, click ILC, and the Chinese SEPC. Uh, mainly key for HEP is a consistent choice of technologies so that these, these different uh, uh, experiment software can then interoperate. This is basically the da data model, which uh, is going to use EDM for HEP. Uh, uh, newly developed package I'm going to talk about uh, in, in a second. Uh, it's going to use the established Gaudi framework uh, that, is, that is already used by some LHC experiments in some sense as a framework. Uh, it will use dd 4 hep also an established package for the detector geometry. And it's going to use uh, a package manager for coming from the, H, the high performance computing community called SPEC. Uh, the goal is furthermore to have this software to be easy to use for librarians. That means the, the people installing and providing the software to users, uh, the people who are developing the softwares, and finally the users. And um, uh, it, it should provide then examples, documentation, templates, and the best practices in, in, in that sense. So uh, at, at the current status is really that the key for HEP software does comprise uh, these three different experiment softwares in a consistent stack. So both for this, what, what was SCPCSW, uh, FCCSW, and Click ILC Soft with the mentioned versions, so from last year. And this is provided on CBMFS, which I'm going to talk about as well. And setting this up will basically get you all of these softwares in a consistent stack. And basically, there are different layers of, uh, of collaboration within Keeperhub. The first one is basically to share infrastructure and tools, which allows us to basically uh, build the, the, the same the softwares in, in one stack. Uh, and then, then it's the, the next ones, which are already basically done as well, is to use a common data model, which provides a common interface. And then furthermore, to, to go towards a, a common framework that then really allows to, uh, to use the same processing workflows for all of these, these softwares. And an additional point is that these experiment software often also include different uh, detector proposals. Uh, so FCC SW has, has, has uh, uh, a click-like detector and uh, for FCC EE and this idea detector concept, which both need, need to be supported by software. Uh, I'm, I'm talking a lot about a uh, software stack. Uh, what, what I mean by this is that, that the experiment software does not live in isolation, but in modern software, this, this, it's, it's usually hugely interconnected and dependent. And through, uh, through several layers of abstraction, it basically uses uh, the, the modern processor, which starts at basically the, the kernel and the library and the operating system, and then building up on core HEP libraries, such as root and gen4, which do input-output, and the simulation of, uh, uh, of, the, of the transport of particles from matter. And then I'm going to more and more specific packages, such as the Gaudi Marlin, which would, would be experiment frameworks handling the correct uh, uh, running order of the, of the frameworks, uh, of the basically the data processing workflow and then really going towards specific experiment reconstruction packages. And in a nutshell, uh, and the key for her project is really about extending this concept that it's, it's good to have a, a common shared library uh, for, 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 for tasks to, to, to these more higher level, more specific packages uh, so that you, we actually can share experiment uh, packages 
uh, in in that sense. And also a, a point to make is that that meanwhile this 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 becomes highly non-trivial to build this consistent stack with this many different packages. This is also why this uh, uh, why we did some yeah, some R and D work to use this back package manager, which allows us to to deal with these complexities of dependencies. So now I want to talk about um, the data model, which basically provides uh, uh, and the infrastructure, the, the interface uh, of, of our software. So this is called EDM for HEP, and it came basically out of an effort to, to try to merge uh, LCIO, which was in use by ILC Soft and FCC EDM, which was used by the uh, Future Circular Collider software at the time. And then in, in kind of like a long process, also trying to make this, to, to design this as general as possible in order to allow, um, to allow to, do, to make this really future proof and, and to allow this to be the basis also for other experiments that, that might, be, might want to use the key for help software. Uh, what you can see is that the, the main features here are that um, there's, there's a, uh, dis a distinction between Monte Carlo and then reconstructed data, and there's some associations that allow you then to, to connect these, these different types. And although it's it's fairly general, of course, not everything can be can be covered. But uh, since it is using uh, a dedicated library to generate data models, this also allows us to to improve to continuously improve uh, and and make this more flexible. Uh, for example, for, for in in order to use metadata and extending these 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 types to be uh, a bit more flexible here. Uh, for the, the detector geometry, um, we use DD for HEP, uh, which a package with it, which is now basically an industry standard in HEP. Even kind of like uh, LHC experiments moving to use it, and this this was really also kind of like a spiritual predecessor to Key for HEP in a sense uh, that this this kind of like uh, made um, was a common package that that then uh, allowed the experiments to do something that was very experiment specific. Uh, but 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 then for, uh, collaborate on on efforts to improve this. So DD4 app aims to provide a complete detector description uh, from a single source of information and even adding even adding information to for like readouts, alignment, and calibration. And it's uh, it's uh, what's what's especially interesting for for future colliders is that it comes with this powerful plugin mechanism that really lets uh, lets one. Uh, uh, swap in different sub detectors and really customize these with parameters very, uh, very, very flexibly. And the, the provided simulation tool DDSIM already directly outputs to EDM for HEP, which is used by Key for HEP, uh, so that, that basically with DD for HEP one can already basically uh, generate data in the in the format used by by uh, Key for HEP. In terms of rock, uh, reconstruction. There's, there are ongoing uh, efforts to integrate uh, new experiment independent reconstruction packages. So Atlas, uh, for, for now quite some time, has tried to encapsulate their tracking code in a, in, in a package called ACTS. And from CMS, there's a clustering package called Clue, uh, which we, we try to use. And for now, the, uh, there's also the ILC soft reconstruction chain. Uh, which is usable through uh, what a package that was newly developed for Key for Help called Key for Marlin Wrappers by my colleagues uh, Placido Fernandez and Andres Seiler. And this allows to run all existing Marlin processors from ILC soft in this Key for Help Gaudi framework that was cho chosen to be used. Uh, so this is an important step uh, for Key for Help to, to, to progress to, uh, to a common software because it does, does a, a large amount of existing and code that was written for ILC soft slash Marlin. And this basically uh, allows in one workflow, as is detailed in this diagram here, and to start with uh, kind of like an uh, and key for help Gaudi workflow, then, uh, then use this wrapper to run a Marlin processor in the middle, and then continue with another uh, with another Gaudi, Gaudi algorithm. So that this, this makes this transition period really, uh, really much easier. Uh, what's there as well is, is then, then kind of like this now let's 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 you both to convert the steering files which are XML uh, in for Marlin and Gaudi and Python for Gaudi and uh, and the input and output so this this is the 
lets you uh, convert directly from LCIO, which was the, the, the data format used for ILC soft uh, and slash Marlin to EDM for HEP. Uh, so having this, this kind of common software for, for, for several different projects uh, also allows us to, to focus a bit more on the software infrastructure, which, which usually takes, takes also quite a bit. So we try to uh, provide the documentation for the key for app um, uh, software, since it's a work in progress, also the documentation is somewhat a work in progress, but still tries to, to be kept up to date. We have the, the um, uh, a package manager that allows basically to build the whole stack from source with um, very, um, hiding a lot of this complexity. Uh, this allows dealing with multiple packages for testing uh, for, and using different system architectures and also would make it possible to use, uh, to use fairly exotic high performance computing architectures. Uh, very important part of modern software is to have automated builds and continuous integration where possible. So we do run a regular nightly build of the complete stack to have this tested. Uh, basically, this runs, runs every day and we distribute the, um, all the releases and, and even nightly builds also on, on CVMFS. And the general uh, philosophy is to release early and often, uh, so to make uh, fixes available early which also leads to to discover problems and correct feedbacks early uh, in terms of documentation there's there's a read the docs uh, style site on cern.ch slash keeperhub and an ongoing effort is to have this uh, run, to, to, to be able to run this as notebooks on the cern swan uh, infrastructure which uh, makes it very accessible for for tutorials and things like this to 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 basically Get started with this software. So I'm very much looking forward once we be able to to basically run the whole key for help software in the browser. Another important thing is to have um, once once you have a common software, it also makes it much easier to compare uh, different uh, software packages and to have have kind of like a validation to to be uh, sure that the, that between releases. Uh, there was no bug and on an issue introduced so that you have your kind of like a, uh, more peace of mind when when running the simulations there are existing packages to to kind of like get different performance plots from the different experiments like the ILD performance package i'm linking here and there's an ongoing effort to investigate the tooling of shan 4 which also has a very extensive validation portal that allows you to compare uh, different histograms over different versions and to look at different quantities there. So we, we, we aim to have the, the same thing for uh, key for help. This already brings me to my summary and, and outlook. So uh, key for help really is an important opportunity for the help community to have uh, to push kind of like common software to really the uh, experiment software. Uh, and um, software is a very collaborative process. So to have to, to, to if you are able to use all these synergies, it allows you really to tackle important challenges that are coming up, like parallelism and and concurrency, and um, put more effort in maintaining common core tools, which really improves the, the software altogether. Uh, the projects that are already using EDM for HEP, key for HEP in their software, I'm not kind of like detailing it uh, in this presentation, but all, basically all of the, these these future collider projects are using EDM for HEP and uh, the framework in some sense already. Uh, there's further consolidation and R&D, more common usage of, of components ongoing, and, and of course the, the, the actual development of new reconstruction capabilities uh, with the packages that I mentioned. And I think I'm already done, uh, so I'm, I, I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you, Valentin. Uh, do we have any questions? No, that doesn't seem to be the case. Okay, since we are at the end of the session and we are already a couple of minutes over time, uh, I would like to thank all the speakers uh, for their very interesting talks and uh, keeping to time. Um, I would like to remind you there is the Mattermost link. Uh, you can uh, check out uh, who is in uh, Mattermost and uh, maybe people can ask further questions in Mattermost or by email. And I'll see you in the next sessions. Bye.
Thanks a lot.